So uh, I'll jump right into it. <sighs> ah, there it goes again. Did the same thing as last time. Or it goes for it. See, it wants to do it forever. So let's see here. Presentation open. All right. All right there. Can everybody see my presentation? Okay, thank you. All right, so I'll just jump right into it. <laughs> Had a hard time figuring out a title for this. <laughs> uh, so becoming a tech writer seemed like the most appropriate one. It's just about what it's like to be in the job market, and then I got a couple of tips and advice on how to ensure that you get the job that you want and how to actually find a job, which for some people can be the biggest hurdle to becoming anything in terms of professionalism. So without further ado, I'll, I'll just get going. All right, about me. If you haven't heard already, my name is John Paz. Uh, I graduated from UCF in 2008 with a BA in English and a focus in technical writing. Yes, it was called technical writing back then. I know that you guys are lucky enough to have it called technical communication or technical communicating. I can't remember which, but I think I was one of the last classes to receive the technical writing degree instead of technical communication. And that's, that's fine with me, but I would have preferred technical communication. Not a big deal. I got seven plus years as a professional technical writer. I'll get into my experience in a little bit. And I have specialization in understanding complex technical systems and a passion for explaining the complex. You'll see more about that as I go along. All right, so one thing I wanted to show you guys, and it was uh, probably what took me the longest about this presentation, was digging up my original resume that I got my first job with. And I felt like it was useful to see from the humble beginnings what it took for me to get my first job as a technical writer. Now, you might not be able to see much of this, but there's not a whole lot to it. It's pretty basic. Got good white space. I know Applin would approve. And if you notice here, my work experience, I've got a, I'm a sales associate, merchandiser, warehouse assistant, customer service. Nothing to suggest I could be a technical writer except for my education. And actually, very high up here, I've got my coursework that I completed. That was kind of a risk. I just threw it out there and figured I need a job as a technical writer so I can stop working at Circuit City. And I don't have any technical writing experience at all. And then my mother explained to me, yes, you do have technical writing experience. You've taken lots and lots of classes in it. And that is important if you don't have any experience at all, just recognize that your classes are experience. So don't think that that's the, that doesn't count for something. It counts for a lot, and, I, and I'll explain that in a little bit. All right, back to the presentation. All right, so I've worked in a whole bunch of industries in the Orlando area, probably more so than anyone you've talked to. And most of that is due to me being a contractor. Um, if you're not familiar with what that is, um, it's where you work on a short, usually a short-term contract between three to twelve months with uh, an employer who has a who has technical writing work that needs to be done. It varies greatly in the kind of work that needs to be done, and it varies even more greatly in the industries that that need your services. Basically, uh, I went where the money was, so uh, I got to work in with en in energy. In video games, which as a gamer was like uh, was was a really big accomplishment for me. I was very proud to work in the video game industry. Although the job wasn't what I expected, and it was a short-term contract that eventually ended. Um, to say that I was a technical writer that worked in the video game industry um, was something I had not heard before. Didn't even consider it until I saw the job online and just a, you know on a whim applied for it and. They, they gave me a chance. They took the risk and gave me a chance, and I don't believe they regretted it. But it, it ended. It ended well. Um, but you know, I moved on to bigger and better things as the day, and moved on to defense, where I spent the spent the bulk of my career. I think about four years, um, working in DoD environment, uh, working for uh, 
several companies that do very similar things. A lot of them actually are down the street from UCF, which worked out really well because I was still in school for while I was working at these jobs. So I was able to commute to my job and sometimes would take off in the middle of the day or early so that I could attend class and then would show up uh, later on when class ended or, or vice versa. Um, my employers were very lenient and they understood that I was still pursuing my degree and that, and that was okay for them. They didn't, they didn't mind that at all. But and then uh, finally, I, the last two positions I've held were in software, um, and one was uh, data integration. They do uh, database, data warehousing uh, products, and the other I work for is healthcare IT, uh, also software though. So some of the companies I work for, there's a handful of notable ones, and most of them are um, you may not have heard of. But Siemens Power Generation is an engineering company. They're actually right across the street from UCF. I used to ride my bike to and from work in UCF, which was a lot of fun because it saved me a ton on parking. Um, that was a, a great job. It took a chance on me, and it was it was fantastic. It was I was winning way over my head, but I had a lot of confidence, and my my employer felt good about my experience, and they thought I could do the job, and I did it pretty well. I also worked for Lockheed Martin again, re the, a reference to my uh, DoD experience. Uh, EA Sports was the video game company that I worked for. They they are out of Maitland, so it's still local. And um, I still had not earned my degree yet when I was working for EA Sports, so I was very grateful to work for them. Uh, got to show up and show up every day in shorts and flip flops. So I could come and go as I pleased, and uh, as long as I worked my 40 hours a week. And it was uh, I had uh, Madden tournaments, you know, two or three times a quarter because they because they produced the game uh, NFL Madden. And that was fantastic because I was a Madden junkie right about then. So that was, you know, every gamer's, you know, dream was to work for EA Sports or work for EA at some point, and especially if you like Madden. So it was a great experience. And I also worked for a bunch of small defense contractors. Do um, the all three of these companies, DEI, Carly, and TJ, were uh, they, in the simulation and training industry, where they create full-scale mm -hmm. simulators to provide to the military so that their military personnel can train on you know, anything from full-scale helicopters to to rafts and things like that. A lot of fun. Also, JHT was also a defense contractor, and Pintaho finally was the last company I worked for before my present company, um, and they did that. They were the data warehousing company. Very technical, um, way more technical than anything I'd done in my career, but um, since I got that taste of software, um, I haven't looked back since. All right. Now about my technical skills. You'd think that with all with this with this experience uh, that I may have some kind of special technical skills. Well, I've picked up a lot of stuff on the way, but it all started with Microsoft Word and a couple of a couple of uh, presentations given uh, by FTC actually on Microsoft styles or Microsoft Word styles templates. And I picked up some things about automation and cross referencing uh, along the way. But most of that is self-taught. I don't have any certifications in, in, in Word or anything like that. But I do consider myself an expert in Microsoft Word. And if uh, if there's one thing that you should know as a technical writer, you, sh you should know your way around Microsoft Word. It can be your bread and butter. You'd be surprised how many people use it on a day-to-day -day basis and have no idea how to do some basic functions within Word. So do yourself a great favor by familiarizing yourself with, with as many versions of Word as you can and going as deep as you can, as deep as you can tolerate. Word can be frustrating sometimes. And other Microsoft tools, of course, PowerPoint, uh, obviously, and then uh, Microsoft Excel uh, picked up along the way, and Visio, which is uh, a flowchart tool, which does uh, it's super powerful and uh, very useful, and it's an industry standard for for any company that draws complex diagrams or, or images. Programming familiarity uh, along the way, uh, actually, in Dr. Applin's class is where I got my first taste of HTML. Um, I probably wouldn't have said that I'd like to do HTML as a career choice if you'd asked me in college, but now um, I think it's absolutely fascinating, HTML5 and a lot of other things. I, I couldn't call myself a developer, not that savvy with it, but I know my way around some HTML code. And uh, XML is just, it, 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 the way I explain it to people is another version of HTML, but it's got custom tags and it can be used for anything from, from metadata and data warehouses to um, to actually documentation that's written that's written in XML, where bolding and italics and paragraphs are all, are all encoded within uh, XML tags and things like that.
to. Looks like someone pinged me there. Is that you guys? Is the is the PowerPoint slide not updating? Is that what it is? Yeah, sorry. For some reason, we're only looking at uh, slide three. What is which slide? Is slide three. So what I'll do is I'll provide you guys with my Google Drive account. You can choose that link to download it yourself and follow along. I'll, I'll let you know that uh, I can, I'll tell you when I, huh. Bethany, have you used this Google Drive app before? Oh, look at that. Damn. Then. Can you guys see the slide now? Or are you seeing my screen still? You see me then. Okay. So let's see here. All right, so what I'll do is I'll keep going with the screen share, and uh, I'll try to make sure I remember to let you guys know when I switch, when I go to the next slide. So let's actually do it. All right, I did that wrong last time. Screen share. Bear with me, folks. So uh, when I ask you guys a question, uh, it'd be nice if you could turn on your mic for a second to answer me, because otherwise I gotta click out of the presentation to look at your answers. So next time I ask you guys a, a question, just uh, turn your mic on real quick, give me an answer, and then you can turn it right back off. Just so okay. I can. I don't have to Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. We're, we're all we're all working with Google Hangouts for the first time, I think, in this context. So. Yeah, and I'm gonna be uh, Corey's voice because her mic's not working. So. Okay. All right, <laughs> we're good to me. go. If you just say next slide, I'll, uh, I'll switch slides in the in Google Docs. All right, so sure. I'm on, I believe this is slide five, about technical skills. So, all right, so I went over that. You know, Microsoft Word is the sweet spot. Every technical writer should know about Microsoft Word. It is your duty to know about Microsoft Word. If not, then I'll tell on you to, to Apple. All right, so graphic design, again, you do yourself a world of favor to get familiar with graphic design tools. Any of them are, will, be, will prove useful, but uh, GIMP and Photoshop are, are industry standards, so get, get comfortable with them. And wiki development and information architecture. If you haven't ever contributed to Wikipedia or you haven't ever contributed to a wiki, you do yourself a world of good to get comfortable with, with contributing to wikis and poking your way around a wiki. And 
It relates to information architecture because if you've ever tried to build a wiki or to contribute to one, part the biggest part of the biggest challenge is how do I organize the information so that it's logical so anybody can contribute to it, or where does my information go? And uh, I've kind of learned uh, through my career that information architecture is something that most people don't care too much about, but that for a technical writer, it makes the, all the difference in the world on how um, how you do your job and how well other people can can contribute or use the things that you create. So if you had never heard of information architectural architecture, Google it, bring it up in one of your classes with your professors, and if and if uh, if they if, if if you haven't heard of it, get familiar with it. Just put it that way. It's it's something that if you put it on your resume, it's a good buzzword that'll get you lots of attention. But you should probably know something about it before you do that. And then database design and data, data warehousing concepts again goes back to my experience with Pentaho that started. Um, they do data integration, um, basically taking data from one place and putting it into another. Um, to, to say I knew knew anything about it beforehand would be a lie. If I started with Pentaho, it would be a lie. But so after working with Pentaho for a year, I got very comfortable with the terms big data, data integration, and a lot of other keywords that are that putting on your resume get, get the right kind of employers attracted to your resume. Um, but that's something that now I find that, it, that specialization is an extremely marketable skill, and uh, it's something that I, I, I enjoy, actually, that I, I'm pursuing cert certificates and online courses and freeware and things like that to pursue more on a personal level, not just for professional uses. I, I started to enjoy it. But if you'd asked me that in college, if would I be interested in databases, I, I'd have told you no and get away from me because data is scary. It is not scary. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's got implications in everything you do in life. And emerging technology, I mean, that's uh, that's very broad and it's on purpose. And it's because if you if you if you're a tinkerer, if you like to to be the first to have the new phone, to have the new operating system, to have the new software application, then emerging technology is your thing. Also, you don't realize it, but first wave adopters of technology are extremely useful people in companies because they're not afraid of technology. I'm sure you've all you all have friends or family who, when whenever Facebook updates their timeline, they get absolutely infuriated because things change. Well, you need to learn to embrace change because technology is only going to get better. It's only going to get faster, and it's going to change all the time. The faster you can you can get those skills under your belt, the more marketable you'll be as a technical writer. All right. So, what's it like to be a technical writer? Well, the first thing I noticed is in the workforce, and I got my first job in 2006, and I didn't graduate until 2008. So, I spent two years kind of as a full-time technical writer and a full-time um, a student, so it was challenging, but I realized very quickly that the workforce is not like college at all. Um, there's there's not always going to be someone to remind you to do your homework. There's not going to be someone to to give you the kind of feedback that you want to feel that your work is appreciated. In a lot of instances, you'll write something and set it off to a black hole and have no idea whether someone found it was useful or not. you got to be comfortable with that because sometimes that's just the nature of the business. And then other times, there's people who are looking at everything that you write, and they want to give you lots and lots of feedback, more more than you care to get. You got to be flexible. Just recognize that there's things going on in college that are not going to happen in the workforce. Um, not least of which is is interacting with people from all different generations. Um, if you have communication issues with people who are of uh, an earlier generation than yourself, then you're going to find yourself with some some difficulties in the workplace because. Uh, with, you'll find there's a stigma sat attached to our generation, millennials, as I call them. Uh, they they think that that we're we're privileged, that we're we expect a lot and don't give a lot, and that we we're not great with communication. It's not true, and you all know that, and you've sure you read the articles in, in in the news about how we're we're a lazy generation, or we're not we're, we expect too much and, and contribute too little. Um, those stigmas are perceived as genuine in the workplace, and they can they can really do some harm about how people perceive you going about your business. Act like your parents and be professional. Be courteous, be polite, and when you make friends with people, that's great. That's absolutely expected. And, and the more friends you make, the, the better your job will go. But you always got to put work first. If you don't, then you can end up getting burned because those people will be your friends up until something bad happens, and then it's every person for themselves. And that's, that's kind of the landscape for most jobs I've found. All right, so the skills you learn 
in everyday classes are absolutely valuable. You are ready to be a technical writer right now, in my opinion. If you've got more than three or four technical writing classes under your belt, and you can you can write uh, you can write a clear sentence about a, some, a complex issue, I think you're ready to be a technical writer. But there's also a lot of other skills you learn in college that are that are vital to to being in the workforce, and that you don't even recognize. It's, it kind of flies under the radar. Organization. If you're if you're unorganized as a college student, you recognize that it, it makes your life much more difficult. You know, you got to get yourself a trapper keeper, some folders or something. Staying organized in the workplace is vital. If you're not organized, then you don't look professional. Even if you're the best writer on, on the team, if you can't find the piece of documentation you wrote when your boss asks you for it, it's going to be a problem. And familiarity with technology is going to take you places. Um, you'll be exposed to a lot of it in college. Um, in your everyday classes, uh, Applin's hypertext class was probably my first exposure to any kind of programming language, and that was, that was I didn't realize how valuable it was until I put HTML on my resume, and then I had employers, uh, or potential employers, calling me and asking me about my HTML experience ex exclusively. Um, I was honest with them and told them I didn't have much, but I had I didn't have much, but I was familiar with it. And in some places that's enough, other places not so much. But just pay attention to things that are going on around you social media and stuff like that. It, it's all useful in some capacity. Context is key, but employers value that kind of stuff. And communication with your employers, with your peers, your colleagues, absolutely crucial. You can't, you can't do enough communicating. When they tell you to, cut, to scale back on it, that means you, you're communicating enough. Because uh, with your job, you, you want to get feedback. And, and the only way to do that is to communicate that you need it. And like I said at the very beginning of the slide, your writing skills are are your most remarkable asset. You have no idea how bad people's writing is in the workforce. It is bad. I mean, managers, VPs, uh, executives, all the way to, to programmers, engineers. It, it's it's and you know I, I'm I, it's kind of, I'm being comical, but it, there's a grain of seriousness in it. It feels like the world cannot write a decent sentence. Um, we we'll throw out the, those technical grammar rules, throw out you know complex the spelling of complex terms, things like that. Just writing simple emails seems to be a challenge for a lot of people. So the fact that you know how to write, that you enjoy writing even a little bit, it's a very marketable asset. And it's probably your most marketable asset. So don't devalue it. And, and learning how to learn. It, it just can't, be, can't say enough about being able to take a, a topic or a subject or a problem that you know nothing about and not being afraid to Google it and do research, do homework essentially in the workforce and just learn as much as you can about something you're not familiar with. A lot of people don't take the time to do that. If you take the time to do the research, it will show in your work. Learning how to learn is is a valuable asset, and I think it's the, it's the most valuable thing that happens in college is, is learning how to absorb knowledge from other from multiple different resources. Again, scholarly re, scholarly research is you know is a, it's subjective term, but you, you understand what where the, where the point of this is, is that just knowing that you have Google behind you should give, give you a lot of confidence to say that I don't know something, but I can find out. And just and being, being able to admit that you don't know something, but you're willing to go try, is, uh, it says a lot about your character. And it's a, it's a trait that's, that's uh, consistent with our generation, so use that. And like I mentioned, also, you're, you're already more prepared than you know, but you know nothing. Admit that right now. Because there's no way you can know everything about a job. Yes, I'm dead serious. If you knew everything about a job before you started, you'd already have the job. And if you did know that, you probably should be the manager who's hiring the person, who's hiring for the job you're applying for. If you had that experience already, you would already be working in a job like that. Or if you got let go from that, that that's fine. They're just expect that the job that you take will be unfamiliar. No matter how much experience you have when you start a new job, it's unfamiliar. Just embrace that. Just be ready to do your homework and be ready to, to tell people that I don't know, but I'll find out. That answer is, is always acceptable. I realize I'm not telling you when I'm transitioning the slides, but I'm sure you guys are able to keep up. All right, so what's it like to be a technical writer? Um, without, you know, without trying to get into to nitty-gritty details, which probably wouldn't make much sense anyway, um, 
it's just a, a brief overview of what the, the similarity between all the jobs I've held. In almost every job I started, you begin each day by checking your email. Communication is key. If you're not communicating with your manager, if you're not communicating with your subject matter experts, if you're not communicating with your peers, then something's wrong and you need to start communicating more. If you don't like email, you're in the wrong profession. It's simple as that because it, your job will be based around email. You'll get requests to do documentation from email. You'll get uh, assignments via email. You'll, you'll receive a lot of the content you're going to write via email. If you don't like email, you are definitely in the wrong position. To-do lists are my thing now. They weren't in college. Um, I learned that if you don't have a, a solid to-do list, either digital, writing down in a planner, or even on sticky notes every day, whatever you do, keep the to-do list and then actually check it the next day to make sure you cross everything off there. But what you didn't cross off, put it on today's on today's to-do list. Do yourself a world of favor. Do yourself a lot of favor there. And secondly, if you think that being a technical writer is about living in a hole and tapping away at your keyboard, you're absolutely wrong because your job involves interviewing people, talking to people, getting information to people, extracting information from experts. These people are really, really smart and really, really busy. So you've got to know what you want, ask the questions, and be prepared to, to, um, to go back at them with when you don't understand or when what you understand is different than how they explained it. The interaction is important, and it's how people will start to respect you. If you hide from them and try to just Google everything, then you will you will you will lose because it's it's in, entirely difficult. It's, it's impossible to do in most instances, if only because the specialized information a lot of times lives inside someone's head exclusively. So you've got to pull it out, put it on right, put it in writing, and then have them review it to make sure you understood it correctly. And then next, after you talk to some smart people, you get to do some work. You got to do some writing, obviously, but more so than writing, or maybe equally so, depending on the position, you have to tinker with things. A lot of times, you've got to create templates, or you have to work with a wiki, or your the, the stuff that you're writing is in a website, which means you might actually have to write some code. It could be HTML, it could be XML, it could be anything in between. It, there, there is no shortage of uh, the need for technical writers who enjoy writing code. If you can understand it, that's enough to get you by. If you can write it, it makes you tw twice as valuable. Next slide. All right. Again, meetings. Get used to them. If you're not talking in them, you're not doing your job. Even if you just want to speak up and say, this seems like there's no documentation for it. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, you understand that correctly. You've done your job. You can now not worry about your documentation for that meeting because they have it. They've said that you don't have documentation for it. Be prepared to, to talk to people, especially in meetings. Finally, you gotta you gotta always review your work or edit someone else's work. Usually, the nature of the business. I'm, I'm sure you're all prepared to do that. And again, more email. Get used to it. Now, are you ready to be a technical writer? Do you have a resume? If you don't have a resume, I'm extremely disappointed in you right now. <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm being comical now, but there's no excuse to not have a resume. I showed you my first resume, and that had jobs on it from Circuit City, from when I worked in a warehouse position, and the, the iteration of my resume before that even had some fast food jobs that I worked at as a teenager. If you don't have any experience, I've, I've given you a solution for that also. List your coursework. List your interests, list projects you've worked on, personal projects, academic projects, whatever. If you don't have a resume, you're not even trying. You need to have a resume, and if you don't have one now, then you should. Go create one as soon as this presentation is over. And are you a strong writer? If you consider yourself a technical writer or you're in the technical writing program, I assume that you enjoy writing or that you feel that you're a good writer. Or do you have some kind of technical expertise? I figure there's at least two kinds, there's primarily two kinds of technical writers. There's writers who like technology, and there's technologists who like to write. You can go either. I, I've, I've interacted with both. I've interacted with programmers who enjoy writing on the side, or writers who like to tinker with programming. And are you ready to work full time? Most tech writing jobs are not part time. A handful of them are. They're few and far between. If you're holding out, waiting for a part time job, you'll be waiting for a while. Hopefully, you have something to hold you over until you can find some work. If you're prepared to work full-time, then you're ready.
So if you can answer yes to these questions, and I feel that you're ready to be a technical writer right now, does that mean that you should go try to apply for jobs? Not necessarily, but if you're ready to take on this kind of responsibility to work 40 hours a week and to jump right into the, you know, to the deep end, uh, I, I have no worries that A, you'll be in over your head, but B, you'll find your way very quickly, and then you'll realize that you that you can do this. It's 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 always more difficult than you imagine, but yet you always underestimate what you can accomplish. My first job at Siemens uh, when I was working at Circuit City again in 2006, two years before I graduated, I wasn't even applying for a job. I just put my resume on Monster as part of an assignment, I think, for Dr. Flamia's class. And actually, the assignment was to create a resume and then to post it online as bonus points, I believe, or something along those lines. And it may not have been Flamia, but either way. It was, it was an assignment, essentially. I, I didn't think much of it. I didn't have any expectations. I posted it on Monster and kind of forgot about it. Um, a couple of weeks later, while I'm working at Circuit City, I get a call on my cell phone, a job talking about... I was, working, I was making like $7 an hour at Circuit City, uh, and Siemens wanted, the Siemens job paid $16 an hour. So I said, oh my God, $16 an hour, sign me up right now. I don't even know what the position is, sign me up right now. I had no idea what I was in for, and I was in way over my head. But it's the best decision I ever made, and I haven't looked back since. So we're, we're all ready to be technical writers right now, in my opinion. Going to the next slide. So about your your first technical writing position, there's there's lots of different kinds of ways to get into it. My first technical writing position was a contract position, but a lot of people start off with internships, and that's fine. But make sure you're being paid for your internship. A lot of people there's there's been lots of uh, stories in the news about unpaid interns and about how they want to legislate that out of out of our economy. I, I it doesn't really concern me to be honest with you. It, it could go either way. If you're going to take an unpaid internship, it should be with a very reputable company or at least with a company or industry that you really, really want to work in personally. If it's not, then you're really spinning your wheels and you're probably working for someone who you might not want to end up working for in the first place. I'm, I, I, I've personally been involved with hiring interns and almost every instance we pay our interns. That's just how it goes. I mean, it's, and you'd be surprised at the, at the rate that an intern can get. It's, it's very respectable. I mean, I hired an intern once that, that hired you know $18 an hour, and they still had two, three years left to go to college, and he still works at that same company uh, four or five years later as a, as a senior technical writer. So it's it's a legit way into a company, but you should be paid for your internship, and, and if not, it should be at least a, a a prestigious company with with some some value behind it that that's not just a job. But most likely, your first job will be a temporary contract, like I've explained to you so far how I started. That's okay. Embrace that. But get used to talking to recruiters. They're the ones who are going to find these jobs for you. And they are absolutely your best resource to find jobs. They can they get job advertised or they get job you know job openings sent directly to them that don't usually go online first. They usually have them um, in their email and they have the job description ready to go, but you will never find these jobs on Monster or Career Builder or Dice or anything like that. Those are jobs that only they will get and they are paid to, to get to get them to get those positions filled. So they should be your best friend when you're when you are in great need of a job because they have personal incentive to find you a job and to get you good money because sometimes they're paid as a percentage of your salary or your hourly wage. Sometimes they're paid a flat fee to just find somebody. In any case, you're not paying them. The employer is paying them, and they're paying them to find someone like you. So they have incentive to treat you nice, they have incentive to, to be honest, and they have incentive to find you work. Don't be afraid of recruiters. Most of them are very friendly, very sociable, and in many cases they're not pushy. They're not going to get, they don't, they don't want you in a position that you can't handle. Otherwise, if you don't make it past the three-month mark, they might not get paid in some instances. So it's, they have incentive to make sure they find the right fit. And they, they usually do a pretty good job at it. And in a lot of instances, your first tech writing job will come from someone you know. If you're not networking now, that's okay because you're still in college, but look around you and your peers might be the ones to help you find a job. I personally have had at least two different instances where one were a friend, a former um, school, a former UCF student who I, who I went to class with helped me get a job, told me there was an opening when I needed work, and then actually took my resume, walked it to her boss, and I got hired from that job. Not necessarily because of the reference, but 
it did help to put my resume at the top of the stack because someone knew me and they could vouch for me. And then another instance is where I hired someone, for, or I recommended someone to be hired for, directly from FTC. And it wasn't that I even knew this person personally, but the only way I knew them was through their work through FTC. And because I saw her name over and over again in FTC newsletters and uh, with, on blog posts and in LinkedIn groups and things like that, I recognized her work. And so when she, when she inquired about whether there was a position open or not, I said, absolutely there is, and I think that you'd be great for it. And I recommended her for the position. And I had I had only met this person once before, and I did not regret it. She turned out to be fantastic. Um, but it just goes to show you that you never know where a job may come from. So keep everybody's name in a database or in your email and tag it with employment because you never know when it might come in handy. All right, your first tech writing position will also likely come from finding someone finding your resume online. So while I encourage you to post your resume at, on any job board anywhere, uh, it never hurts. Um, just don't post anything. Make sure your resume is good and it should be updated if you're actually looking for a job. If you're looking for a job and your resume is three months old, an employer won't even take a look at it. They want to see the jobs that the people who have posted their resumes within the past week. So even if you have to go there every day, just click the update button so it looks like you've posted it every day. That's fine. Just keep it updated, keep it fresh, and make sure it's good. Have someone take a look at it. And so it also like your, your job will come from applying for a job. Almost every single job I've applied for has been some sort of electronic application. So get comfortable with, with submitting online applications because uh, a lot of times it's filling out forms, simple enough. Sometimes you can just attach your resume and that's the end of it. Some of the more prestigious companies have very tedious and long application processes and that's for a reason. They want to weed out people who don't really want the job. They don't want people to just apply for them. Google doesn't want people to apply for their job just because it's Google, even though people do that. They want people who really want to work there. If you've ever applied for a job at Google, you realize the application could be three, four pages long, and most of that information is already on your resume. So it feels like, what's the point? Well, there's, there's always a point, um, and even if there's not a point, that's what the requirements are. If you want that job, you need to do, do what they ask of you, do it right, and take pride in doing it well. All right, next slide. And your first tech writing position about the interview. <laughs> Your first interview will be terrifying. There's no getting around that. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Because even if you don't get the job, there's something that you can learn from it. There's no getting around your first interview not being scary. So just the sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be able to, to be confident and be honest about what you about what you can bring to the table. Uh, the next piece of advice is to be honest. Uh, that doesn't mean that you tell them everything you did bad when you were 16 years old, that's not useful. But be honest about what you think you can accomplish, but be confident about what you can accomplish also. If you don't know if you can accomplish that, say, I don't know, but that sounds like something I think I can do. And they might ask, why do you think that? Be ready with an answer. And like the, the bullet before that, be honest about your answer. I told Siemens that, they said, could you think that you can do this technical editing, editing position? I, I told them that, I am a very strong writer. I'm a very I read very complex books for fun, and I enjoy technical con concepts and technical ideas. And I think that with a little bit of training, I could be a very good editor. Now, in retrospect, I'm a terrible editor, at least from of my own work, and that's part of what I had to do sometimes. And I and I probably could have done a better job at it uh, before this job. But going into the position, I felt like I could do it. I know now that that's not what I enjoy doing for work. But until I until I figured that out, you know, I, I felt that I could do this on a day-to-day -day basis. It was something that I enjoyed doing, at least I thought I enjoyed doing it. And then, you know, I realized halfway into the position that it was not something I really enjoyed so much. Just remember that you are a unique person and that you, you bring a lot to the table. You have skills that are marketable. And people will pay you for it, believe it or not. And again, get comfortable. I think that bullet got left out. It got left over. All right. So just some general advice about landing a technical writer position. Again, I told you before, recruiters are your friends. I, I tag every single email I get from a recruiter, no matter how basic or trivial the job posting that they're trying to get me to apply for is, I still give them the same amount of respect, the same amount of attention that I do for any other ones. If, if I'm not interested in the job, I say thank you for your inquiry, but I'm not interested in applying for this job. Feel free to keep my information in your contact list and reach out to me with, with the future positions. Literally, it's, it's, it's pretty much a phrase I have in a box that I send to any recruiter who absolutely is not providing me with a job I'm interested in. 
but treat them all with respect because if not, they're not going to call you for the next position and they may not submit your resume if they don't feel that you're appropriate for it. They're your friends though. They will find you work, I promise. And embrace your interests. If you, if you haven't decided that you're ready to apply for jobs yet, that's okay. Just, just know what you like because that makes a difference in the job that you get. Because if you like, uh, for instance, I liked I liked websites. I liked games. I liked. Uh, I was. I found out I was interested in programming. You know, after college, but these are things that I, that I found out I was personally interested in, and so I started gravitating toward that. So I started when it, when it was time for me to find another position when a contract ended. I, I knew what kind of company I wanted to work for. That makes a world of difference when you're applying for a job instead of just firing a resume at a black hole or at, at anything that moves, which is a which is an approach that a lot of young people take, and it, I, I can't. Say that it's not effective because that's that's kind of how I worked whenever I needed to find position when I was out of work. You fire your resume, anything that moves. But if you have the choice to to apply for companies that you prefer, it helps to know what your interests are and it helps to have some experience outside of academic experience. You've got nothing to show for work experience. Anything that you tinker with, that you play with, you, you like mobile development, that's useful. You like websites, that's useful. Everything is useful in some context or another. This, all right, the third piece of general advice is go to a conference. I know FTC offers, uh, at least they, they did while I, while I was there, they, had, they went to the annual STC summit and I, I went on two or three different occasions um, and it was fantastic. It's great. It's great for learning new skills. It's great for networking and it's really great to see what other people in your industry look, talk, and, and, and act like, if only to, to mimic them so that you can be, when, when you act like a professional, people will treat you like a professional. So it helps to see what professionals act like. The conferences are, are key, if, if only just to, to figure out what, this, what, the, what the landscape looks like. And be nice to your professors because one day you'll ask them for a letter of reference or a piece of advice or just to review a new iteration of your resume. So if even if you don't do well in their class, show them respect, communicate with them often. If you can remember something about what their personal interests are, it always helps. And if you think they did something well, tell them that. They like to hear that feedback all the time. But I've had to lean on a couple of my professors, if only for letters of references for applying for graduate school and other things like that. They are invaluable resources that, and they're, they're sources of information that you cannot find in other places. I pro and and they've, since they've already know your name and that you have UCF alumni sticker on your on your shirt whenever you graduate, they will always give you the time of day. And that's not the, that's not to be said about other people that you work with in in the in any industry. Once you leave a position, a lot of people don't want to give you the time of day. But your professors will always at least answer an email and tell you they don't go ahead, they don't have time right now, but answer it later. Be nice to your professors. It'll pay off. And when you're searching for a job, be industrious. Fire your job offer at, at, at any position that you th you match about 60 to 80 percent of this of the requirements. I say apply for it. You don't have anything to lose. Just send it off and be genuine about your application. If you don't think that you have all the skills, say that in a cover letter, or be prepared to explain that in an interview. Just don't be too timid about it. Just make sure you do it methodically. You keep records of where you applied for and that you genuinely submit an application that's tailored to that position you're applying for. Because if you don't tailor your, if you have just a very general bland resume, then you look like a very general bland candidate. Just that simple. If you don't have something that customizes what your, how your experience relates to the job, you're going to have a very tough time on selling yourself. So, if they, and it takes them more than 10 seconds to find that piece of information that's vital about why you're, you're good for this position, then you're, you're going to have a really hard time getting past that stack of resumes that, in, in which your resume is in the middle. So just tailor your resume to each position, which can feel tedious, but it will pay off in the end. And don't get discouraged. You, you'll, you'll apply for 10 jobs before you get it before you get an interview call, and you'll go on 10 interviews before you get a, a job offer. Make that your your mantra. Make that keep that in the front of your mind so that when you get a rejection letter or you get a phone call to tell to let you know that you did not get the job, or when you get no response after sending your resume to an HR black hole. Don't be discouraged. It happens to everybody. Uh, and my personal philosophy is that jobs are like people. They are born, they have a life, and then they die. No job will last forever. It's as simple as 
recognizing that when the job is over, appreciate the, what you learned from there and move on. Don't hang on it too much. Even if it's the best job in the world, there's always something else around the corner, and you, you can always provide value to another company, or you could work for yourself. And when you actually have, when you do land a job, or when you're in college and you're not sure you, you're ready to jump into the job market, but you get that one job uh, uh, job advertisement or opening that you're ready to apply for with that one company that you that you really really admire. I'm a Google fanboy, and when I see a Google tech writing position open up, I almost immediately have the instinct to apply for it. Now, right now, I'm trying to to gain some tenure with my current company, so I've, I'm avoiding that personally. But if if it was the case that uh, an HR recruiter from Google called me personally, said that we we saw your resume online and we'd be interested if you or we want to know if you're interested in applying for this position, you're darn right I'm going to apply for that position because like I mentioned earlier, I'm a Google fanboy, so I want to work for Google in some capacity. But the, sometimes you, you learn while working for these really fancy companies that they're not as they're not as well they're not what they're cracked up to be, and in any case, you might have been happier where you left. That's that's a risk that you have to be willing to take. If you don't do it, then you end up with regrets. But if you're if you're happy where you're at, that's fine. Stay there. But if you think it could be better, don't be afraid to take a risk. Just make sure it's a smart risk. If you have a regular full-time position, it may not be in your interest to take a contract job. And also, be grateful and and be humble because you never know when the chopping block is coming. I've had positions that were regular full-time positions that ended unexpectedly. I was in, in you know I was laid off. And it was my first regular full-time position, actually. After working contracts for two or three years, I, f I left a contract for a regular full-time position, taking less money and a further commute, thinking that I was doing the right thing. And then I found out at an all-hands meeting I was being laid off, much to my surprise. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be grateful for the time that you had there. Be appreciative of your manager, because honestly, in most instances, it's not their fault that you were let go as decisions out of their hands. And you also risk if you don't if you aren't grateful and you and you think that you can just take any job you want, you risk being labeled with that stereotype I mentioned earlier is that oh they're just the stereotypical millennial. Those young kids don't appreciate anything. Well, you know that's not true. You appreciate lots of things. Just don't 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 let people perceive you that way because you're not saying thank you. And then you know say, sending the thank you email after after an interview is important. Sending uh, sending a letter of appreciation when uh, when a when a company is giving you two or three interviews and you didn't get the job is important. Just, there's lots of different ways you can show that. Just make it make it important. Make it um, make it a priority so that you that you show that you're appreciative of it. Because if anything, it's just to avoid that being labeled that stereotypical millennial. And also, if you're not minding your social media, if you're tweeting, if you're on Facebook and your profile and your privacy settings aren't aren't correct, or if you're on Google Plus, then you're just ranting and raving about things that are politically incorrect. Or I'm not. Either way, for whatever your political leaning is, it's not important. Just that there's a time and a place for it, and in most instances, it is not usually social media. I'm not saying to to censor yourself. I'm just saying be mindful. If you if you can't, if whatever you're posting, you couldn't say to your manager's face, you probably shouldn't post it at all. Employers care about that stuff, and they're they're searching more and more on potential candidates, uh, or they're searching social media more and more to research on potential candidates. So if you have something that could be potentially embarrassing, do your best to get it off social media. Do your best to get it out of the Google search so that when they type your name in, the first thing that pops up is your LinkedIn profile or your resume or something that's not the tweet about Barack Obama and bashing him or, or anything like that. You, you want to appear as a, a sensible, moderate person, even if you may not actually be that way because employers don't want to hire an eccentric person. It's just harder to work with. <clears throat> So say you're not ready for a job and you still got a year or two left in college. Well, there's a lot of things you can do to, to, to help push your career along that you may or may not earn money for. Blogs, product reviews, um, you know, uh, useful tweeting. There's lots of hashtags that can be used for that are related to tech com or to anything that's, and honestly, it doesn't even have to be technical related. Just something that you enjoy doing. Just write and write a lot because those things will be very useful as writing samples in the future. A lot of college students come come out with their portfolio of academic projects, and when you got nothing, that's better than nothing. When you when you got nothing but that, it's better than nothing. But I'll be honest with you, um, when I applied for the job in Tahoe, all the work I had done before then was for DoD companies, so it's proprietary and I couldn't share it. It's against the law for me to share that some of that stuff. 
So I told them, I said, I, I couldn't do that. Do you? And, and so on a whim, because I already had a job, so I didn't have much to lose if I didn't get this job, what I was applying for, I said, I could, give, I could share my blog with you. And it, a lot of my blog posts are, are, have political themes. They're not, I don't shy away from talking about controversial topics, but I always do so in a professional kind of academic manner, and I do put my best foot forward. I try to make it a, a professional-looking blog. Now it's it's been a couple of years since I've updated my blog, but my, it, when, after my after I got hired at Pentaho, the person who hired me told me bluntly that if it, that your your blog was fantastic and some of the posts that you wrote really encouraged me to hire you because you seem like a great writer. He told me that verbatim that it was my blog post that kind of pushed me over the tipping point to get to that position that I was not technically prepared for. I had no data warehousing experience before that. But because I was a good writer and I was honest and I was open, they thought that taking a chance on me was was worth the money. So they did that and actually got quite a pay raise to do so. So don't let, don't let anybody tell you that blogging is useless because it got me a job. It got me the you know one of the better jobs I've ever had. So and it's also okay if you land a job that's not necessarily a tech writing position, as long as that's the kind of position you want to work for. Remember, every job you, you work in should be a step toward where your end goal is. If you don't have an end goal, that's fine. Do whatever that makes you happy day to day. If you have room for growth, that's even better. If there's a managerial position waiting for you at the end, I say go for it. If you're working as a barista at Starbucks and you hate coffee, what are you doing? You need to find something else. You need to, it'd, it'd be worth your time to quit that job and take the, uh, the 40 hours a week you'd spend there. Spend that 40 hours a week sending out resumes to anything that moves. And if you find yourself with that, in that position where you're spending 40 hours a week just applying for jobs and you still can't find anything in the Orlando area or whatever area you're looking for, there are many, many places in America specifically that are hotbeds for technical writing. Um, I wrote an article for uh, for an online magazine called Tech World, um, and I linked to my Tech World profile uh, at the end of this presentation. But there's lots of jobs in D.C., in California, New York, in Texas. There's there's these little pockets of tech writing goodness that you can find anywhere. Just don't be afraid to relocate. If you've got a family and if you or you've got children or or people in the area that you're connected to, that's okay. You can stay here and try to tough it out. But if you're on your own or you're ready for an adventure, pack up, get the heck out of here because there's lots of other opportunities in other places. Don't be afraid to relocate for a job. And actually, I, I, it'll probably be one of those things you, you do not regret. And, and honestly, learning to code will be your best asset. The highest paid technical writing jobs in, in, just in general all involve some type of programming language or some type of engineering also. That's another aspect of it. But Personally, if, the, if I could only give you one piece of advice from this presentation on how to make yourself more marketable, it's learn a programming language. I don't, I don't mean you have to become a developer. You don't have to learn how to develop an entire mobile app on yourself. But if you can understand the concepts and the technical side of things and, and how to recognize a mistake or how to troubleshoot a mistake or just how to speak the lingo, you will make yourself exponentially more marketable. It's the difference between making $35,000 a year in your first job and making $70,000 a year in your second and third job. And we're talking two or three years worth of experience, $60,000 a year if you know some kind of programming language. You don't, have to be a, you don't have to be a developer, but knowing code will make you money. You don't have to go take a course either. Take an online course. Take, uh, take a tutorial. Teach yourself something. Try to build something. Make it useful. You don't have to start with the history of programming like most programming degrees probably start. You don't have to go to Programming 101. Make a project for yourself. Try it out. I promise you, you will not regret it. Even if you don't enjoy the coding, the actual coding part of it, just knowing of how to talk about it intelligently will make you more marketable. So that wraps it up. There's my contact information. I've already provided you guys with a presentation. So I encourage you all to get in contact with me. Um, I'm, I answer email almost, you know, always during working hours during the day. If the, if the sun is up, I pretty much answer emails. I answer it on my phone and, and vice versa. And, and also, you know, hit me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I'll follow you back. And if you got questions, I answer them on Twitter. I'm, I'm probably not as responsive on Twitter as I am via email, if only because uh, too much noise sometimes and don't always have the time for it. And then connect with me on LinkedIn. Just make sure you you know you you send me a little message in your LinkedIn invitation, letting me know how I know you. Because some instances I get 
um, in, uh, um, invitation invites from uh, from recruiters who I don't know, and I have to ask them to explain themselves before I accept their invitation. You skip that step by just telling me, "Hey, I, I was involved in the presentation you gave for FTC. Just want to connect, and I'm, I promise you, you will not regret it connecting with me because I get lots of job inquiries that I just pass on to people who are looking for work. So if you're looking for work, connect with me. I'll help you out. I'm not promising you anything, but if I get something that it seems like it might be useful to you. I got no problem forwarding it on and giving you some advice on how you should apply. And finally, those last two links. Um, I mentioned that article I wrote about where the jobs are in technical writing. It's a breakdown of uh, the different areas, which is the most which is the most marketable area, and which is the most profitable area. And you'd be surprised the two are not one and the same. So uh, check me out on Tech World. I, I've only written one article for them so far, but I plan on writing many more. Um, it seems like it's some time. Um, and finally, the last link is my rather outdated blog, but that eventually, when I get some time, I'll try to keep it updated and, and do some more posts. But uh, for now, that's that's my thing, is uh, speedgrow.com. And without that, I think that finishes it up. So if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, I'd like to answer as many of them as I possibly can. I can understand if anybody's got to go. Oh, hold on. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, Corey says that you already answered a lot of her questions. Yeah, you answered a lot of mine. It was very detailed. It was great. Yeah. Uh, so I try to keep it light, but I end up rambling sometimes. Sorry about that. Uh, I Oh, I never ramble. I mean, you could ask anyone. <laughs> uh, Andrea, are you still muted? Because I've tried to unmute you. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not working. Okay, Andrea says it was a great presentation. Uh, oh wait, sorry, before I said that, I popped in. All right. Oh, one of my questions was, do you have specific tips for your LinkedIn profile? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, want to give as much information as you can. Um, don't worry about information overload on LinkedIn. You want to be honest but professional. Um, include a picture of yourself that makes sense, and when you don't have any work experience that's relevant, like like with my work, like with my first resume, list all the courses you have, and then try to put there what your objective is. I, I always discourage putting the career objective field in your resume. It usually it's just filler, but if you don't have any work experience, it helps to know what kind of job you're looking for for recruiters who are, are looking for people to apply. Okay. Really good. Um, what other tools have you used for your online presence besides the blog or LinkedIn, or if those been your Twitter a little bit? Do you have other social media tools you use particularly for promoting yourself for jobs? Hmm. Twitter surprisingly can can reveal a lot of uh, jobs that are that fall between the cracks. Um, it's important to realize that to post a job on Monster or Career Builder or things like that. That employers have to pay money for that a lot of and a lot of times. So you can leverage that to your advantage by finding smaller companies who want to hire just somebody maybe temporarily on on uh, on Craigslist periodically. Twitter usually has a lot of good resources you can follow. If anything, people can point you in the right direction on who might be hiring. Twitter is a, is an untapped resource for most people. Yeah, I, I have to admit I am only recently starting to really use Twitter, and even then, I'm not very consistent, and I've been told consistency is important. Which you can hashtag techcom with two M's. It's, you'll find lots of stuff. Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, so, Andrea, I guess you're still muted. I'm not sure. Do you have questions you want to type to me so I can ask them in the chat? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why the unmuting didn't work for her. I had so many questions, and you answered so many questions. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and I liked your PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, Andre asked... Okay, uh, Andre, I want to know if you had uh, more than one mentor who gave you the drive and motivation to get where you are today. Hmm. Okay. Um... There were a hand, okay. So the primary three professors who I worked with most closely, uh, Dr. Applin, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Flamia. Um, Applin and Jones uh, were great about helping me refine my writing skills, about giving me lots of 
feedback and um, telling me where I can improve. Flamia was uh, probably the one who encouraged me most to just get out there and try. It'll never hurt. Um, but personally, um, I got lucky with my first job, just having someone who wanted my skills and me not caring that I couldn't do the job. Because <laughs> when I, I was really in over my head on my first job, uh, my, when they handed me my first document to edit that, that an engineer wrote, I couldn't understand any of it. So I was I was a little scared at first, um, but um, I went to Flamia and said, you know, I, I, maybe I can get should I start reading some more editing books and said, no, just start trying to do your job and try trying to do it better and get feedback from your manager and they'll help you out. So that was that was probably a really good piece of advice that I didn't even realize at the time. Okay. Uh, great question. What would be the most beneficial coding language or languages to dip your toe in? Mm. Great question. Um, HTML5 is very simple. Um, it's actually more simple than HTML because a lot of the tags now are descriptive and instead of having just a div tag for everything, now you have a header tag and a body tag and and, and the tags are actually labeled um, so that you understand what they're supposed to do instead of just uh, an industry standard that's been around for a long time. So HTML5 is a great place to jump in. A lot of free tutorials out there, too. Uh, did you use a lot of tutorials when you were teaching yourself? Is that, was that your main way no, about it? Exclusively. That's the, that's the, and actually, with, with one job, it was part of my job description to know XML, but they had a style guide that I could go from. But in every other instance, it's all self-taught. Uh, Corey or Andrelic, do you have any other questions? I'm happy to relay them if you like to me. I'm sorry that you're mm -hmm. muted. I will figure out what happened later. <laughs> Corey says, I. I think she's working on it. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, Corey says she's jealous of your EA experience. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's uh, it. You'd be surprised that when I worked there, um, I was I was it was a temporary contract, and they didn't even really know what the position was going to be. And they actually, I was in, I was in contention against a bunch of much more senior technical writers, and they told me this at the the first interview, and they actually told me I didn't get the job, and then they called me back two weeks later saying none of those people worked out. Do you still want to apply for the position? And I was like, heck yeah, I want to apply for the position. Like, oh, are you kidding me? And then I wrote this really passionate cover letter, and they told me after they got hired, my manager told me that it was my Madden experience because I was a diehard Madden gamer, and I also play other EA games. And it was my passionate cover letter. They said that got me the job because I said that I would basically. I, I can't remember exact. I, I could probably pull it up if I wanted to, but it was like I, I said I'd like I'd run through a wall for Madden or something like that. Something silly like that. That I was. I just. I, I didn't. I didn't hold anything back. I said I want to work for EA Sports because I've always wanted to work for EA Sports, and to do so as a technical writer would be an honor and a privilege. And so they. They dug it, and, and I, I got the job. And I, I tell you what, I, I was jumping for joy to get to get paid the amount that I was getting paid, and to have free cereal whenever you want it, and video games in the lobby. Oh man, can't beat that. Okay, uh, Corey says she would love to work as a tech writer for a game developer. Are those mainly contractual or contract based? As far as <clears throat> um, when I worked for EA Sports, uh, actually there was another technical writer who worked there who was. Full time, regular full time, had been there for a couple of years already, um, but they, he was the only one. And when he hired me, I was the second technical writer, and I worked for project management, which had a very specialized position for me. So, but since then, I have seen EA come out with at least two or three different technical writing, junior technical writing positions over the past two, actually the past year. I actually was tempted to apply for it, but the pay grade wasn't where I'm at now, so uh, I'm. And I got lots of bills to pay and got a family to support. So, if the money's not there, it's going to be hard for me to consider it. But if I didn't have any any worries, I would definitely go back and work for EA. But keep an eye. Go, so go to the EA dot. I think it's either EAJobs dot com or something. Just Google EA and jobs, and you can sign up for alerts. And I get those alerts all the time. Whenever there's a technical writing job for them, I always at least read the job description and see how well I match it or don't. And it happens about once every year, once every two years. So you get you can get lucky. Uh, Andrea had a question. I, I really want to work for Google or Microsoft, either as a technical writer or in their associate marketing program. Google wants to be candidates who are creative and think outside the box. How do you think I should go about doing that? That's a great question. Great question. And actually, um, the the blog, your blog, is a good way. Um, some interesting. You know, so if your tweeting habits are regular and predictable, people. Get followers just by posting tweets at the same time every day. You'd be surprised how, how interesting 
connected people are just to have consistent information about a specific topic. And then if you can get some coding things under your belt, if you couldn't code a website, that's interesting. If you can do something interesting with a mobile app, you, I'm telling you that the, to do this stuff, it, it seems so intimidating and so big at first. It's really, it's, it's simple and there's a lot of tutorials out there, a lot of things you can start from that you can just modify or tweak. Do something interesting. Build something. It doesn't necessarily have to be documentation. And I'm telling you, Google pays attention to that stuff, and so does Microsoft. So create something is the way to be creative. Yeah, I, I, who, who knew? <laughs> okay, course is great. Thanks. Uh, any other questions from or chatting people? I think. Let me see what. I like is like checking off some of these questions as you were like going over your presentation. So I felt so prepared. Trying to think what question caught up during the presentation. Oh, we couldn't see the part with your with your resume, unfortunately. Oh, no. So what I'll do is I'll I'll go ahead and I'll just provide that to you on Google with Google Docs because I got no problem. At this okay, point, awesome. It, you know, at a certain point in my life, I would have been embarrassed to share it because I honestly did not think that it was very good. And looking at it, it probably needed a little bit of work. But I do think that it was a good effort, especially for someone with no experience. I had a lot of gall just applying for jobs that I did with the, with the little experience that I had. You think that was one of your greater assets? Oh, absolutely. And actually, my, my confidence is what um, is a lot of people by surprise. And sometimes people think of it as being cocky. But honestly, I don't think of it. if you don't believe in yourself, then no one else will either. So uh, I recognize that you know people have been telling me my whole life that I was a decent writer, and um, in college I was initially a creative writing major, and I switched to a bunch of other stuff that wasn't very useful to me because I just couldn't get into it. So I figured I need to I need to write for a living, but I need to creative writing doesn't always give you um, money. So sometimes <laughs> I look outside the box, and I technical writing fell in my lap. Um, my my mom uh, is a professor at UCF, and she knows Dr. Applin. And Applin had been trying to convince me to to try the technical writing program for a while. And it was actually a flyer created by an FTC student that convinced me to try technical writing for the first time. And uh, I haven't looked back since. And actually, wow. it's funny because the guy who made that flyer ended up being a friend of mine. He was the president of FTC for a while. And so I was I was like, wow, man, you convinced me to be a technical writer. Corey says, the power of the flyer. <laughs> yes, the fl flyers are powerful. You have no idea. There are a lot of bad flyers out there. <laughs> oh, tons of them. And you know what's funny is that once, you, once you're a technical writer or you're a decent writer and you can edit and note and spot grammar errors, you realize the world is filled with them and you can't ever turn it off. It happens all the time going to restaurants. <laughs> Man, man, especially restaurants from like people where English is not their first language. It's, I feel terrible. Like you want to offer them advice, but then people think that you're arrogant. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm just a writer, and I recognize you need some help. <laughs> you're just providing a service to the world. Exactly. So I, I'm up, I've uploaded to this Hangout. I don't know if you guys can see it. If you click the Google Drive on the left. You should be able to see it. I violated a lot of my own rules, which is a lot of the rules I have now. But I also do, actually, a good way to make money on the side um, for anybody who's interested is to uh, offer to edit in people's resumes. You'd be surprised. But like I said, the whole Microsoft Word thing should be your sweet spot. If only so that you can do resumes on the side, it will make you 20, 30, quick 20, 30 bucks from people, some people who's de who are desperate, somebody who just want to help out. If you can format a resume, you can always make money on the side. I, I promise you that. I get, I've, I've probably processed over 100 resumes over the past three or four years, and I got like a 100% success rate of people finding jobs after I've done their resume. I just a format I use that I memorize, and and I just I actually care about what people put on their resume, so I help them refine their experience. That can make you some money though. Uh, do you typically keep your references on your resume? No. Actually, it's actually what's great is if you if you want to put the re the references upon request, that's fine. But you don't want them to have all the information unless they absolutely need it to make a decision on whether to invite you for an interview or not. Because so imagine it like this: they say this person seems great. I wonder if they have resumes. Now they have to actually talk to you to get your to get your references. The goal is to just start that interaction. Because otherwise, you're just a piece of paper. Once they talk to you, they see you're friendly, they see you're personable, and that you're confident. Then they'll want to invite you for an interview, regardless of your references. I, I, but I, I definitely think it's a no-no to keep it on your resume because it's keeping coming back, you know. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the, the mystery of the mm, resume. Exactly. I know I've heard a lot about tailoring your resume for specific jobs. Did you tailor your resume for every job you applied for? Or did you have variations of resumes, or how have you got about that? Both, actually. Um, there are a lot of positions that are related to technical writing, like instructional designer, which is like uh, someone who creates courses for usually adults, not children, like the military. Um, how do you teach a soldier how to how to fire a new weapon? Well, they have to have a course in how to do that. Who designs that course? An instructional designer. So I thought for a while in my career I might be an instructional designer. So I created a new version of my resume just for instructional design. Um, I didn't end up not going that route, but um, I probably still have it in my file somewhere. So I have different iterations of my resume for different types of positions. But then when I'm ready to apply for a position, I look at the requirements. I usually have I usually compare the requirements with my resume and try to make my resume match the requirements with being as honest and truthful as I possibly can. Um, if you, uh, you can stretch things a little bit, but if you're not willing to answer a question about it in an interview or if you don't have a good answer for a question regarding something on your resume, you're better off leaving it off. But always have the job opening that you're applying for open while you're tailoring your resume. I mean, literally, when a, when a hiring manager is, is looking through resumes to see who to invite with an interview, they have a checklist, and that checklist is that job opening description. So they say it requires three years of experience. If you don't have in the first le the first sentence or the first paragraph of your resume, I have three years of experience in technical writing. They won't even look past the rest of it. So as long as you can check off the boxes as you're as you're tailoring your resume, so can the hiring manager. It makes them much more likely to want to invite you for an interview. Okay, so you focus on keywords from the yeah. from the job buzzwords, are, buzzwords are good, but really, if you can um, signify that you meet those requirements um, with something other than the exact language they use in their job opening, which is not really, you know, it's pretty obvious what you're doing if you if you, if you you just use the same exact language that they use in their job opening that you do in your resume. You can risk sounding, you know, kind of absurd, but for the most part, as long as you, you're close to it or you, it displays the same kind of qualities you're looking for, that's okay, too. Okay, Andrea had another question. Um, in what ways have you demonstrated your work to recruiters? Did you have an online portfolio or did you have a presentation book of your writing samples? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, earlier, I used to tote around a portfolio that I had to create for one of Dr. Flamia's classes yep. that was filled with my fantastic pieces of academic work from, that I turned in for Dr. Flamia. Um, actually, that's what I brought to my EA presentation, and they looked at, they, they opened it, looked at it, closed it, and didn't even look at anything. They didn't flip through any the page. They flipped through the pages, but they weren't really reading it. I could tell. So I, I, fi I figured out that uh, bringing the writing samples to an interview. Unless they specifically ask for it, I try to avoid it if I can. Um, keeping uh, stuff in Google Drive really helps because then you can just provide them with a link, and I think that's fancy. It's not so fancy. It's very easy to do, but um, I just keep it digital if I can. It's much easier. Not usually a portfolio type, though. I mean, I, I have pieces that I work, and I can compile them all into one file and send them off or just provide them links to my blog and things like that. That works out really well. Do people often request uh, samples of your work? Yes. Okay. Seventy-five um, percent of the time, I'd say they they want to see a writing sample before, um, or either before to get an interview or after as a result of an interview. If it's after an interview, that's a good sign. If you if they ask for writing samples after they've already talked to you, that means they want to they think you're legit and they want to verify that by seeing some writing samples. They're still willing to invest more time in you. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. One of my so questions. Uh, which is kind of broad and uh, maybe not really easy to answer, is uh, do you have advice on what not to do or missteps, things you have found through trial and error? Ooh. See, I've done... <laughs> it seems like you've done really well. <laughs> you know, you know if all, the, if all the things I've done well, I've got probably two more things I haven't done well. Um, a lot of the advice I give people is as a result of screwing things up myself. So um, be, staying humble one thing I had to work at, like I said, sometimes I come off as arrogant. In some instances, I probably was. Thinking that I'm a good writer is okay, but thinking that you're such a good writer that you can wait to the last minute to do things is not okay. So staying humble is huge, and the, so the reciprocal of that is avoid thinking too highly of yourself, if only so that your work can be good. When you think too highly of yourself, you tend to miss things. So try to stay humble. Okay, so avoid overconfidence. Yes. But be confident, just keep it in check. And how, how do you go about doing that? Do you just 
reflect. To your parents. Your parents always oh. listen. Oh. <laughs> Whenever yeah. I need, whenever I need a reality check, I, I call my mother. I call her the dream killer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, but uh, so she gives you a dose of reality when you need it. Every, whether I want it or not. So. <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, my my mom's the same as I understand. Uh, any other questions from Corey or Andrea? Anything else? We we really enjoyed this. This has been great, and I think people are gonna. Really appreciate the archive presentation. I think probably other people had trouble getting in like you did. Yeah. Because I keep hearing good. little sounds from my from my browser and trying to switch to it, but distracting. Uh, Andrea says she doesn't have any other questions. Corey says none. Really great presentation, and she appreciates the answers you provided. Uh, Andrea says this was an awesome presentation. So we all really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I guess. Thank you, you don't for inviting me. I've I've wanted to give back to FTC for a long time because I got so much from it when I was there, so I'm glad well, I could do it. You have helped us get more out of it. <laughs> we really appreciate it. So I guess, I guess that's, that's all we've got. Thank you again. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. I, Thank you so much. So you tell my favorite professors I said hi. Tell a Flamia, Jones, and Apple, and I say hello. The big three? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I refer to them that sometimes. They're like the ones that you have pretty much have to take a course from. And yeah. I heard so much from them. Uh, Corey says thanks. Uh, Andrea said she had Flammy over the summer and she's so nice. And I could not agree more. She's just the sweetest. Her technical communication class is the best. I love. It was one of my favorite classes of all time. Mm -hmm. Made you, you know, sure that this was what you wanted to do. What's that? I said it helped make you sure that technical writing is what you wanted to do. Oh, absolutely. And it actually, it was. It, I had no idea at the time how relevant it was. I work with virtual teams on a daily basis, and I have for the past five years over two or three different companies. Most of the people I work with, the engineers, the experts, they live in India or in England or in Germany or in Australia and you have to get used to working with them through video chat like this. That's why I, I'm, I'm comfortable with doing it now. Right, hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry, uh, my cat just turned on my Xbox and opened it. So <laughs> <laughs> Apparently she tried to tell me something. So I, I guess we can, we can wrap up now. Uh, if anyone had any additional questions, you gave us your contact information, which is great. And uh, I'll make sure you get the link to this too. So, you know, if you need to show people what a great presenter you are, you know, there's the proof. <laughs> no, you're too nice. You're too nice. This was the best presentation we've had so far this semester. I mean, it's the first one, but you really have started up strong. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. I'd be, willing to, I'd be willing to give it again. So, anytime. Absolutely. All right. Oh, uh, Andrea says, thanks for coming to chat with us. Have a good night, everyone. Very uh, nice. good. Right. Thank Good you night. guys. I gave you guys my contact information. Get in touch. Absolutely. Bye. All right, guys. Bye bye.